So um, I also wanted to ask about um, about the kind of the production process, as it as it were. I mean, we we had recently um, a guy from from Interscope Records and A and R, Dave uh, Renee. Dave Renee. Was, yeah, he uh, he studied a production course with us. I think he um, you know been in the industry for for a long time and wanted to be able to relate to artists and producers, I think, as, as well as remixing. And I guess being in the, the kind of dance world, that, that comes up a lot. You yeah. Know? Um, so do you have any kind of um, involvement in any kind of production process? Yeah, of that, I, I work Logic, I work Pro Tools. Okay. Um, you know, have made dodgy records in the past. <laughs> um, definitely not with my name on or anything. Um, but I think more than anything, unless you really are aspiring to be a producer, um, for an A&R man, what that gives you is an ability to communicate mm. with a producer or with an artist in the same language and the same understanding that they have. Instead of make it more purple, yeah, yeah, you can yeah, say, yeah. look, the bottom end needs a bit more compression, mm -hmm. it's about 20 kilohertz, why don't we do that? You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's being able to just speak on, on term with them in, in a language that they understand. And, yeah. and also knowing, you know, when you analyze and sit and listen to hit records and you see how they're made, mm -hmm. And then when you can hear something that's almost a hit, but it's just lacking something from one of your favourite records, it might be one, or it might be the, the song, it might be the melody, it may be that it's not bright enough as far as production is concerned or anything else like that. It's just being able to spot it yourself mm. and, and communicate that with the producer. You know, and instead of just saying make it bigger or yeah. make, I guess it, make it a hit. The, the, the kind of the knowledge plays a, a communicative role. You know, the fact that you Definitely. know terminology and know, um, you know, what a logic project looks like, etc., must must be an amazing advantage. Really. Uh, yeah, and it, and it also allows you to, from an from my point of view, you know, I get the stems in and I'm there in the office and I'm chopping things up and doing edits or or. Re overlaying acapellas over instrumentals and and tightening things up or just doing that and so that I don't have to communicate with someone to try and get my vision across yeah. I do it send it to somebody and say that's the arrangement at least or mm. that's the, here look I've turned up the bottom end I've turned up I've put some more top end on it for sparkle on these bits that's what's missing and they can start getting a, a clearer picture of what I'm looking for yeah Let's talk about uh, Devolution as well. Yeah. Um, have you got any of their tracks that we can hear? I have. I've got a couple of um, their tracks here. Okay. And they, they have a release coming out on Black Butter. So it's just out on Black right. Butter. Um, it's been going great. I've been managing De uh, Devolution for just over a year. Um, and again, sometimes you carry on doing what you're doing and the time comes around for you to have your moment. Um, because they've been doing great remixes, DJ mixes, we've been plugging away, building support from Mr. Jam at One Extra, Target, Cameo, um, and, and then tail end of last year, or actually summer of last year, that support went into Annie Mac on Radio One, um, and it's just building really nicely. And now this future bass, future garage, future house, future whatever you want to yeah, call it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, 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 it's time now. Yeah. It's, you know, Disclosure at the front, they're running. Rudimental on Black Rudimental, well. yeah, it's, um, it's all looking really good and the, it's carrying on and having belief in what you're doing even though it doesn't necessarily feel as if it's right when, when they were doing stuff like this and there's Avicii and Afrojack yeah. and Swedish House Mafia with dance music on steroids um, and they're thinking you know where do we fit and everything is you know has its cycle and it's it's come round and they're they're really hot at the moment and radio is starting to love them and they're DJing everywhere and every festival this summer and what's the, the kind of story behind these guys how did you come across them? Uh, well there's two guys one's Pete Devro who used to be the Artful Dodger Oh, right. uh, one okay. half of the Artful Dodger, oh, yeah. at least, anyway. And a guy called Tom DeVos, who was signed to Steve Angelo's label, Size, quite some time ago. Um, funnily enough, my lawyer put me in touch with Pete, because we share lawyers. Right. He's like, hey, look, you know, he's doing some good stuff. Perhaps you should uh, go and have a chat. And he was right. He was doing some great stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, but again, it was, there was nothing going on. Yeah. 
it's like, okay, well, we need to build this and we need to slowly see where we can just carry on raising your profile with each remix, with each release. Um, and now we get to a point now where we're all in a really good space. Yeah, most definitely. It's a great record and uh, it's out right now, you said as well? Yeah, this is, out as a, this is actually out as a free download on um, Black Butter Spread Love. Okay. It's part of a, a, a three track EP, there's this. There's um, Listen to the Bad Man um, and this one, which is If You Believe. And again, we've an EP is good because, you know, Annie Mac um, started with my friends, has moved on to Listen to the Bad Man. She had it as her record of the week, Special Delivery. Mr. Jam has continued supporting uh, my friends and If You Believe. Um, and it, it just allows as producers as well, as well, it allows them to just be slightly flexible with their sound yeah, yeah. across the three different tracks, and so they're not being pigeonholed yeah. just for one thing immediately. I think for me, definitely, a three-track EP gives that, especially there's, there's you know, the third track almost gets yeah. to be slightly, slightly different, maybe slightly yeah. weird, a bit more experimental. Yeah. But, you know, it's a really nice way to put it out. And I have to excuse me a second. There you go. Uh, yeah, it's, it's looking really good with them now. We're uh, writing like mad for the second EP. We've got a hell of a lot of backing tracks. They now got vocalists going in um, every week, and we're just sorting through songs. Um, sort of in between them going off and DJing, or we've we've cut back on all the remix requests now, right, just yeah. just so that they have time to do their own thing. And when we've got our own music, and because again, it's it's that thing of having strategy. It's like even though we're self-releasing or releasing via Black Butter or low-key releases, you can, there has to be continuity. Yeah, yeah. We have to get the next EP out by the end of April. Um, it has to be right. You know, if it's not quite there, then it might there might be a slight delay. But in between those two EPs, we've got little DJ tools where they've chopped up old bootleg records and stuff that they use within their DJ sets that will have as free downloads. I think you know they they did a Mr. Jam guest mix. Um, they had Animac special delivery. They just on Friday did the Animac mini mix, and then at the end of this month they're doing the guest mix for Cameo. So we're just constantly keeping their profile and I out guess there. With an artist like that, the remix request must be off the off the side, yeah. It's right? and you, you know have to kind of make time to maybe put a little bit of a stop to them and focus on their own material. Yeah, it is. It's it's. You, you have to sort of look at the long game because it's very easy to go, okay, we'll take a couple of grand to do a remix yeah, yeah. And, and we're done and it's in. But if that stops you from writing your own material or you give away one of your best ideas when, it, when you're meant to be stepping up a, a notch, um, it's best just to hold back and go, okay, right, we will do remixes um, and it makes you more sought after in yeah, the end anyway. Yeah. Just to get a rep has asked, how did you get into a in the first place? And, and do you have any advice for someone looking to, to get into it now? Um, it's changed drastically how, now by comparison to how, when I got into it, I just bugged the hell out of people. Right. <laughs> um, it's, it's the same attitude whether or not you're making music to wanting a job, it's just persistence, you know. I mean, back then, it was London Records that I was trying to get a job at because they were my favourite label and Pete Tong was there with FFRR and um, and they were on fire and you know the the promotions guy who for radio Billy McLeod who now works in Australia for Warner's he uh, I you know did silly things like befriended the security guards went in at seven <laughs> o'clock one morning filled his office full of blue and white balloons because he's a Glasgow Rangers supporter saying give us a job you know just just wouldn't get out of his face to the point where when a job came up somewhere else mm. at Universal, he was on the phone to them going, look, you should at least talk to this guy. But in the meantime, what I'd also done is found, uh, I wanted to go in at Radio Promotions because right. I loved radio, I loved listening to the radio. And um, I knew that how it worked. I'd researched and I'd found that, you know, Radio One or Capital Radio, the producers have appointments and the pluggers, as they're called, go in, play the music to the producers in consideration for a playlist or to be played on the station. So I just called up Radio One people. And I'm like, hey, look, 
I know you wouldn't normally see me, but I'm trying to get a job as a plugger. It would really help if I came in and sat with you and see what you do. And also, if when I do get the chance to have uh, a, an interview with a label and I'm saying, yeah, I've seen a producer at Radio 1 that does The Breakfast Show and I've seen a producer at Capital Radio and I've done this and they're sitting there going, how did you do that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I called them and I wouldn't take no for an answer in the, in the nicest, politest and possible way. You know, it's, it's a really thin line between pissing someone off and, and being just on the right side of like, okay, you're serious about this. Come on then, I'll have a chat with you. Yeah. You know, um, whereas now there's, you know, interns, there's schools. I guess schools. it's a similar thing though, and interning, you know, you, you're kind of making stuff happen for yourself, aren't you? Yeah. You know, you're kind of putting yourself in the spotlight, making yourself available and, you know, kind of getting right involved really at the deep end. Yeah, and you, n no job should be too small, mm. you know, whether or not that means it's three weeks of not doing the glamorous stuff, but number crunching making tea it's like it's if you really want to do it you know be appreciative the, the big thing is is getting your foot in the door and being very appreciative of at least getting your foot in the door because there's thousands of people that want to be inside a record company or want to be a producer or want to do this and and it's it's pretty much the same for all alike you know it's persistence it's belief that you're right or that it's the right thing for you and whether or not that's making a record or wanting to work inside a label it's if you're making a record and you there's so many tools at the moment when people like me aren't taking your calls or they're we're ignoring your emails because we've got so many other things going on and we're just not there and so suddenly you email me and you go hey look i've got 10,000 views on youtube and you're like Okay, well, that's low by comparison to what I want, but you're doing something. Mm -hmm. You're getting involved. I've got the track on this blog. I've got my mix on Eat and Messy or Majestic Casual or you know, any of those. And it's like, well, you get it because you need to understand whether or not, as an artist, how a label works. And self-releasing and promoting your own material will give you a really good understanding of when we're screwing it up. So that you can say, why are you doing that? You know, if you haven't got a clue, you don't know what we're doing. And we might not get it right all of the time. So um, it's, it's about having as much knowledge and intelligence on mm. the whole thing and the whole setup. Oh, yeah, I think it's something that's come up again and again when we've spoken to, to um, industry professionals like yourself and artists and DJs is about um, really putting in the groundwork, you know, making sure you, you know um, the industry and, and kind of you know doing it for yourself almost you know if if things aren't happening then then why not go out and and you know kind of uh find artists and you know kind of work with people and and you know i think it's it's a really valuable valuable thing yeah it's the <coughs> in what there is available at the moment from the likes of tunecore being able to get your music onto itunes mm -hmm. you don't have to deal with itunes directly um to you know the everything from youtube to blogs to you know bbc introducing shows shows at one extra they the producers are open to new music that's what they're about mm. you know that's why they're there it's a different ball game when you're trying to get in on the daytime areas of radio one but you need to build yourself into that point before you can get there before you're ready to be able to be played on daytime radio um, and it's about building up a base with you know, with uh, the specialists and the people that are appropriate to play your music and will play it regardless of whether or not there's a story, so long as it's good. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's what we did with Evolution. That's, it's like, you know, the boys went and to Junk in Southampton uh, where Mr. Jam was playing, like, this is our tune. Yeah. You know, here you go, here's a CD. Yeah, and yeah. like, Mr. Jam loved it and... He's been a fantastic supporter mm. since We've had since Mr. Then. Jam in and he did actually say, I think, that he preferred being handed a physical, you know, thing rather than just a kind of faceless demo sent on email. I think. It's yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult because you do have to find something to set yourself apart. Yeah. Um, because they, they, I, everybody gets so much music continuously. It is physically impossible to listen to it all. Um, and you kind of, it, it's hard to say what the markers are that would make me notice something, 
but it, it's, it's a, either a persistence or the fact that you've got things going on. So it's like, okay, this is when it's just, hi, I think I'm going to be great, here's my MP3. Yeah. There's every chance that that's just going straight in the bin. Mm. Which might be foolish of me at times, but well, it hasn't bit me yeah. on the arse yet. <laughs> Wondering in terms of kind of like the major labels, like do you kind of see in the in the foreseeable future, like if they're going to still be kind of monopolising the, the scene, or do you kind of see kind of smaller labels coming up? And kind of I think smaller through? labels already are coming up. You know, um, they it's an expensive game. It's, you, you, we reap our rewards when we have success, but we don't always have success. And so the major company can afford to take the blow of spending the money and not having the success, so long as we're having success elsewhere. If you're an independent and you don't have a big catalogue or you don't have four acts that are constantly having top 10 success, and you put a lot of money into something that you think is going to go all the way and give you all the money back, and it doesn't, you know, it can cripple you. Um, there's a huge place for independence. They're absolutely brilliant. Um, and I don't subscribe to the kind of major versus indie mm. battle, or oh, the majors are terrible, or, you know, indies are where it's at. It's like everyone, majors do something, you know, it's, it's like a major record company does something. It tries to take an artist and it tries to put them in a very big platform and tries to make them as aware, or the public as aware of them as possible, and then hopefully the public like them enough and will go and buy their records and go and pay to see them on tour. Um, you know, independents do the same thing. They kind of, they're a breeding ground, and you know, Black Butter are a great label, um, and, but they signed Rudimental onto Atlantic Records to be able to have the big injection of cash put into it and, and shoot a lovely video and really go for it and just have more than the money just have a, a very big experienced team working a record and knowing when something quite might not be right or or you're on the money and we're sailing it's not to say that the independents don't have people with experience and that our teams are just normally bigger um, and we tend to have I think by comparison so kind of like the 80s and 90s when there really was a David and Goliath thing going on. Mm. Um, there's a much better working relationship with independents and, and majors now. I was gonna ask about what makes a good A&R, you know, is, is that I? I'd be damned That's if I be know. <laughs> <laughs> um, Not doing a bad job though. <laughs> no, it's, yeah, it's, it's the, the year I would say is mm. first and foremost. Um, and then you kind of are to a great extent in the lap of the gods because there's a lot of timing and luck mm. to a certain extent that goes into it um, because there have been amazing records, amazing artists that haven't succeeded. And it doesn't mean that they're bad, mm. it's just the stars weren't aligned, it wasn't quite the right time at radio or the, the, the public weren't quite ready for that sort of sound and then suddenly that sound comes in. It's like, I mean, look at Alex Clare. Mm. He was signed, made the album, uh, dropped. Microsoft picked up the track for uh, the the ad, mm -hmm. and suddenly it's it's everywhere. And you know, and then he was he was re-signed. It was just people weren't ready for it eighteen months previous. Mm. Um, so you know, I would like to think that first and foremost, it's able being able to hear a a good, strong hook or record. I, I, I sound a little bit ambiguous about that because it's not just a song. It could be an instrumental track, it could be a riff, it's especially in the dance world. Mm. But you know, with artists, it's invariably, um, do they have the ability to write themselves or have they, so do they have the ability to write a good record? Have they got a great voice? Does that voice not only sound great coming out of a studio, but does it sound great when it's on live at mm -hmm. a small dodgy pub and there's only ten people standing around? Um, and then it's and then it's thinking of, okay, I love the sound of this record, or I, I love what this artist is about. How am I going to set this up? Well, who who's going to play this? How does it fit on TV? 
where where where's the where's the so entry point at radio? The picture, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know how how immediately am I going to be able to? Who's going to be the supporter at radio from a specialist point of view, mm. or from a daytime point of view? It's kind of like just trying to analyze a lot of those sort of mm. factors that will go into it. So I guess I guess you know once you've you, you, everyone can kind of hear a good record, but it's seeing it you know where it fits in in the whole industry. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> At Point Blank Online, you've got two methods of interaction with your tutor. Firstly, you've got the weekly online masterclass, which is in real time. And then also we've got feedback on your assignments, and that's known as DVR. So the online masterclass is a one hour session you get with your tutor every week. You can ask questions about lesson content and get instant feedback and also demonstrations on the fly from their computer desktop with our streaming technology. DVR stands for Direct Video Response and the concept is really simple. You upload your Ableton Logic or Cubase project file to your tutor, he downloads it and then pushes record on the screen capturing software and evaluates your work, so basically giving you one-to-one -one feedback. You see all of the mouse movements and any parameter changes made by your tutor. It's kind of like sitting in the studio over their shoulder watching what they're doing whilst they work. We have found the DVR process has truly revolutionized the way that we teach online and the results speak for themselves. Book your place on the course now by visiting pointblankonline.net. <laughs>